Plus California is pleased to welcome you to How to Build a Yiddish Social Club with Jake Schneider. This event is being supported by a grant from Klez California's Yiddish Culture Fund. Born in New Jersey, Jake is a Yiddishist who's been based in Berlin for many years. As part of the U loose group Yiddish Berlin, he's been organizing the conversation group Shmues and Wein since February 2022. I'm very happy to turn the spotlight to Jake Schneider, who will share with us how he did it and how the rest of us can do it as well. Thank you so much. Um, so just bear with me for one second while I share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, and, oops, do you know how to do this? Okay. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, and thank you to uh, Judy and Klez California. Uh, oh, sorry, thank you to Klez California for supporting this event and to Judy for the introduction. Um, um, just a few words in Yiddish. Der Wahlstadt wird vorkommen auf Englisch und auf Zoom. Trotz unser Thema und unser Ziel hat zu tun mit Aktivitäten, was spielen sich ab auf Yiddish. Panem auf Panem. Entschuldigt die Iranier. So um, I'm Jake Schneider, um, and um, yeah, I was I was born in New Jersey and raised partly in an Orthodox community, but not a Yiddish-speaking one. Um, and I moved here uh, to Berlin 12 years ago, um, where I've been working as a professional translator, mostly from German, and doing various literary and cultural projects on the side. Uh, during the pandemic, I became very quickly obsessed with Yiddish after many sort of advertisements by different friends who were getting more into it. And, um, and I, I knew it was really important uh, personally, um, but also, um, yeah, I, I fell in love with it. Um, and I did everything I could do to learn the language intensively, but mostly online, um, which is partly what led to this project. Um, so uh, um, also I, I wanted to ask if you could actually, because I, I can't see the chat, but if you um, could, those who are interested, change your, your name on Zoom to include your location if you like. Um, you can do that by, um, I think, right-clicking on your own face and renaming yourself. Um, this is completely optional, um, but part of our our goal today is to think about our own location as I talk about my location, because it will be very different. And so you're going to be comparing and thinking about what might work um, in your context uh, and how that would be different from 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 ours here in in Berlin, which is a very unusual place, as I will talk about. Um, so. Um, so here's a brief outline of today's workshop. Um, so I'll start with some basics um, about the um, format and the Berlin context, and I'll, then I'll tell you about our group. And like I said, as I do, please um, think about your own communities and the major and more subtle differences between our circumstances and where you live. Um, the idea is to learn lessons from our experience, but this project can't just be cut and pasted into other places because every situation is unique. Um, and I'll share some lessons as I understand them. Um, even people within our group would disagree about what the lessons are. So this is only from my perspective as a member and as the coordinator of our group. Um, and then I will show you some photos and videos. Um, I just would like to say for the people uh, in our group who might be in the photos, I'm only showing them today to the Zoom audience. Um, I couldn't ask every individual person because there's a lot of people in these photos, like um, but I will be um, to, like, taking the them all out of the recording um, cool. that, that, gets, uh, that gets distributed in the future. Um, uh, and then we'll be talking about um, some considerations for planning if you want to okay. think about your own projects. Um, the then comes the time for questions. Excuse for me, me, Jake, 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 could you ask somebody to mute all because Hello. people don't have their yeah. microphone off? I'm sorry to interrupt. This is just the, the host needs to mute all. Um, yes, if you could please, if you could please, um, do that. Um, yeah, this is Judy. I've muted everyone, but Jake. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so then um, so then that's the time for questions for me after I, I've shown you um, everything I have to present uh, in the presentation part. And then at the very end, um, hopefully there'll be time for, for me to ask questions to you and for us to think about um, some of these larger ideas and how they apply to different contexts. Um, so uh, to begin, um, so why would you make a Shmuis Kreis? What is a Shmuis Kreis? Well, it's a, a conversation circle um, and there's various di different... Um, oh, actually, I should also say at this moment, um, I will be distributing all of these slide texts to everyone who signed up by email. So um, if you... Um, you don't need to write down what's on the screen. You can write down things that I say or things that you think about um, as, as we're talking, but don't worry about taking down notes from everything. And also, I think we already mentioned the recording. It will be on um, Class California's YouTube channel within the next week or two. So don't worry if you need to leave early. I will try to keep on time, but um, if we go a little bit over, um, there will be a recording. Um, okay, so um, why make a Shmuzkreis? So what is a Shmuzkreis? It is some version of a Yiddish conversation circle where um, typically secular Yiddish speakers, as in they could be practicing Jews, but maybe do not come from a Yiddish speaking community um, uh, or come from a Yiddish speaking community, but are not living their daily lives in Yiddish, um, come together and, uh, and speak Yiddish in a sort of defined place and time. Um, and there's very various different versions of this. I think our version is quite unusual, um, but I'm curious to hear more uh, from you all later. Um, so there's, these are some reasons um, why this is a great format, in my opinion. Um, it's accessible. Uh, it's possible to do it completely for free. <laughs> um, you don't really need a budget, and it's grassroots. Anyone can start a Shmuz Kreis, um, and um, these also happen on Zoom, but we're going to be talking about in person. Um, it's a way of showing the Yiddish is a li living language and actually enacting that by speaking it with your friends. Um, it has a very social community component. So, um, you know, everything that happens in any kind of social situation can happen in Yiddish. And this is a place where everyone in the room speaks Yiddish. So you can, you know, just experience your community. And also that continues outside of the Shmuz Kreis. Um, even though in our case, many of us uh, speak other languages outside of that setting, but some of us do speak uh, or, or text each other in Yiddish. Um, and that, that has happened more and more over time. Um, so it's a de dedicated Yiddish speaking space. Um, also, because most of us are non-native speakers, it's an opportunity for people to share words and grammar and you know, language with each other um, in a very sort of horizontal way, uh, you know, um, not teacher student. Um, although obviously, you know, there are teachers among us, um, and maybe it's sometimes hard for them to be in this non-teaching environment where people are making mistakes, um, but it really is a peer-based uh, learning environment, which is not primarily about learning, but definitely um, does have learning happening. Um, ideally, it can be intergenerational and welcome people of different ages, um, and it creates connections and leads to other initiatives um, that you can't predict just by the fact that people who speak Yiddish are hanging out with each other and having conversations. You never know what kinds of projects they will come up with. And we've definitely seen that in our group. Um, lots of events and different projects have grown out of it. Um, and it also, for the people involved in Yiddish education here, uh, I, I, who, who might look at this and see it as a kind of, um, you know, like we're taking away something from the Yiddish education uh, infrastructure. Actually, I think it provides a de destination, like what? where do you go after you've learned Yiddish up to a certain level? Uh, in many people's lives, there isn't a place for them to go, except for maybe Zoom, um, if they don't have a community in their location. Um, so it's an incentive, especially if you know that a lot of people are ha hanging out and having fun and singing, but you can only do that if you're able to speak Yiddish up to a certain level. Um, it gives them that incentive. Um, so those are my, my um, most immediate reasons uh, that I can think of, but I'm sure there's others. Um, sorry, I'm having a bit of a technical problem. Uh, let me just restart this and hope it 
doesn't freeze again. Okay. So next, um, local context, Berlin as a case study. So um, the local context, as I already mentioned, is very important. Um, and I'm talking about our group, which takes place in a specific place, but you should think about your local context also in the abstract. Um, these projects exist within an ecosystem of Yiddish stuff, of Jewish stuff, of Ashkenazi stuff, of music, theater, whatever else is happening in your place. If you suddenly create this kind of group and it gets big, it will become part of that ecosystem. Um, uh, not, it's not one size fits all. Um, so like I said, um, what works in one place won't necessarily work in another. It also builds on past organizing efforts and involves collaborations with existing groups. So the things that we did were partly thanks to all of the organizing that happened before this group started. Um, the people who already knew each other, the stuff that was already in place. Um, and we also collaborate with other groups um, which already existed or, or, or formed uh, since we started. Um, and it has an impact on other projects. It fills gaps, it reshuffles things, um, and it creates kind of a fertile ground. Um, I think if you meet the same people every two weeks in our case, um, no matter what the context is, you will get to know each other better. You'll have um, more you deeper relationships with these people than you would if you saw them just in a class or um, you know in a in a more temporary context, um, especially if this is in person. Um, the demographics are an important factor. So if you know who the Yiddish speakers are uh, in your community and you know how old are they, what languages do they speak, what are their daily lives like, that really affects where you want to organize this kind of project and what time you should schedule it. Like, when are these people free? Um, sorry, I think someone's unmuted. Um, and then um, lastly, um, it's a way of thinking global and acting local. So just like Judy was saying at the beginning, um, how Clez California has a locally rooted um, uh, place in the world, but also is involved in the, in the larger Yiddish community, um, we see that the same way. We are being the future you want to see for Yiddish on a very small scale. Um, okay, so now a bit about Berlin. So Berlin is a very weird place for Yiddish. Um, the project I'm presenting tonight also doesn't exist in a, in a, a, a vacuum. And um, you know, if you're looking on a map of Yiddish land, Berlin is just a very strange little dot on that map. So what works here might not work elsewhere. Um, and you'll have to think about your own place, and I'll keep on saying that. So one of the most important things uh, why Berlin is weird is that people here speak German, and German is the closest, most closely related language to Yiddish. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that more later, but, um, but it really affects the way that the language is perceived, and people's process of learning the language is completely different if you speak uh, German versus anything else. Um, we are also living in the country that perpetrated the Holocaust um, and that is just completely omnipresent whenever you do anything Jewish here. Um, and it very much affects uh, the way people see Jewish projects um, in the city. Um, so, so a lot of things that we do are, I think, partly in response to, to having the Holocaust like very visible in, in our lives. Um, the Jewish minority in Berlin uh, or in Germany is extremely tiny, uh, maybe like 0.01% of the population. Um, and most of us are Berliners by choice, uh, specifically in Berlin, um, from the former Soviet Union, uh, the countries of the former Soviet Union, and Israel and the US, and then scattered people from other places. Um, there's a, a very small number of, of real German Jews um, and um, and then some other European Jews. And we'll talk about um, uh, various demographics later. Uh, I would say it's also comparatively young. We have a kind of strange generational structure here. Um, there are older, there's definitely plenty of older uh, generation of Jews, not so many Yiddish speakers among them. Unfortunately, that generation isn't so much with us. Um, and if they do speak Yiddish, they're not actively involved in it. I don't know who they are. Um, 
We also have plenty of Yiddishists, I would say, for, for any city, I would say we have a large number, um, but we have no big Yiddish institutions. Um, and I think that is very unusual. I think most cities that have this many Yiddishists, secular Yiddish speakers, uh, have bigger institutions than we do. And finally, we have a very DIY mentality in this city. Um, as you can see on the photo, that's a that's a um, a ten year old photo, but it's still you know, for me having a a, a community garden like this, it just looks like a scrap heap, but it's actually a community garden. Um, on the site of a former airport, um, it just really cap captures the the essence of a Berlin DIY spirit. So it's the wild west of Yiddish land. You can kind of do anything yourself, but you don't have any money. Um, so here is um, Berlin's Yiddish e ecosystem as best as I can summarize it. Um, keeping in mind that some of the, these recent projects grew out of Shmuis and Vine, um, like I mentioned, because it's a fertile ground, and in some ways Shmuis and Vine couldn't exist without the projects that preceded it and exist alongside it. Um, so the first thing to say, uh, because we're not native speakers, is uh, education, Yiddish education. Um, so on the um, top right uh, is Katrina Kuznetsova, who's here with us. She is one of the only Yiddish uh, teachers in the city. Um, also a, a very active member of our group and of Yiddish Berlin. Um, then uh, uh, beneath that, you have um, the Yiddish summer program, which is uh, every few years, it's happening again this year, um, uh, is, um, is a very large summer program organized by MEDEM, uh, the, the Paris Yiddish Center, um, which moves from between several cities uh, over a, a rotation. And when they come here, they provide quite a lot of Yiddish education, including to local people, um, but just on that kind of one summer at a time basis. Um, you can also learn Yiddish at the University of Potsdam and in the, um, um, there's a kind of Jewish adult school that has Yiddish classes, not very focused on um, speaking Yiddish, but more about reading it. Um, the Technische Universität, uh, has uh, a class and also, as you can see, the Zoom logo, people can learn Yiddish online from any number of various uh, institutions and, um, and bodies uh, that offer Yiddish classes online um, around the world. Um, yeah, I should also say Katya Katarina uh, is also teaching via Hamburg uh, Jewish Adult School at the moment, so um, that's equally accessible because it's on Zoom. Um, okay, then we have these grassroots projects, um, which are also very self-organized and usually organized by a particular person. Um, so Lehen Kreisen, Schmuz Kreisen, and Schreib Kreisen. So the Lehen Kreisen uh, uh, reading circles, there have been Lehen Kreisen in Berlin. I would venture to guess someone's been reading Yiddish together since the war. I have no idea, but at least for decades. Um, the the current Landkreis that um, that our group is part of probably has about ten years of history, and they meet um, once a week every Sunday. Um, there's also um, yeah, there there have been Landkreis that are more English speaking or more German speaking. It depends. There's also been a Schmuiskreis, um, very different from ours, that started in 1997. Um, organized by um, by Professor Arnold Gro uh, at the at the TU, um, which is uh, one of the technical university in Berlin, um, and that was mostly uh, Holocaust survivors who um, came together with some young, younger people who wanted to learn uh, Yiddish, and unfortunately that older generation of Holocaust survivors who were in that group is no longer with us. Um, so it's kind of more become a beginner's class as, as best as I can understand it. Um, we also have a Yiddish writing group, a Yiddish poetry writing group, which started recently, uh, which I'm a member of that, Kat, that Katya, who I just mentioned, uh, is organizing. Um, we met in person originally, but we're currently on Zoom. And we've had readings of original Yiddish poetry um, a couple of times now. Um, so Yiddish Berlin, uh, as uh, Judy mentioned in the introduction, it's a loose group. Um, it was founded by, um, by co-founded by Aunt uh, Beck um, and Katya uh, Kuznetsova, who I keep mentioning, 
Um, and that was before the pandemic, maybe uh, 2019 is when it officially started, but it was based on um, events that had been going on previous to that and also grew out of a Lian Kreis, I think, um, and out of Shtetl Berlin, which we'll talk about later. So all of these parts of the ecosystem are connected. It's difficult to, to trace the history, but Yiddish Berlin specifically is not a registered organization. It's really a collection of people who have lots of different initiatives who work together on these initiatives um, and also have a website and a Facebook page, um, um, but it is very loose and decentralized. So I would say our group falls into Yiddish Berlin um, in this very decentralized way. Um, one of the main ways that Yiddish Berlin um, organizes things is through art exhibitions, which typically Antbeck um, puts on often at a particular gallery called Galerie Zeitzone, um, or like time zone gallery. Um, this was a mural from 2019 by, um, by Ella Ponizovsky Bergoson um, um, with uh, um, text from Kaji Malodovsky, and that was painted on the wall for the exhibition. And then typically during these exhibitions, it would be art, which may or may not be related to Yiddish, um, Often there's some connection, but there will also be a lot of events held at the gallery during the time of the exhibition because basically we own the space for a limited time and we'll fill it with events. Um, and then, yes, he, here are some of the few other events that we've had over the last few years, um, some of them since Shmuis and Vine, um, a couple of them before that. Uh, um, readings, we had a Purim party. We had a book talk. Um, I've been giving presentations about queer Yiddish. Um, there were several events for the Night of Murdered, murdered Yiddish Poets. Um, we had a third, a third, uh, third Seder uh, salon, and um, also a night on International Women's Day uh, celebrating Yiddish women poets. Um, and um, this was our first theatrical reading not too long ago um, um, together uh, with uh, Daniel Galai, who, who organized it. He's, uh, he's the um, director of the Leivik House in Tel Aviv, um, and he came and, um, and directed it. It was just a reading. And Ocean, who I think is in the audience, uh, was also in it, um, as was uh, Anna Rosenfeld, um, who's another important member of our community. Um, I also give um, walking tours of uh, Yiddish speaking immigrants history in Berlin um, and uh, play Yiddish music on the street. And it's a lot of fun, lots of family stories. Um, so that's, that's another project. Um, a little bit about the music scene. So we have um, a, a local klezmer Ashkenazi music scene, which is very connected to our Yiddish language and literature scene, but also quite separate in some ways. Um, this was a concert with some of the big names living in Germany, Sasha Luria, Daniel Kahn, uh, Craig Udeman, and um, Mark uh, Kovnatsky, together with Michael Alpert, who was visiting at the time. Um, and the music scene centers on a group called Shtetl Berlin, which has a, a big festival and a smaller Nishkin festival every year. Um, unlike Yiddish Berlin, Shtetl Berlin is now a registered organization that can apply directly for funding as a group, but it's also still very DIY. Um, for example, they also host klezmer picnics or klezniks in the park. And they have monthly klezmer jam sessions at a bar, um, and they just celebrated their 100th session after 10 years. Berlin also has an annual cabaret called Jews, 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 featuring the drag queen Nana Shevitz, among a num number of other projects with some connection to Ashkenazi culture. Overall, though, Jewish institutions in Germany tend to be focused more on the history of German-speaking Jews or contemporary Israeli culture, and diaspora culture often falls through the cracks. So the role of German. Most of us who live here um, and are involved in Yiddish also speak German. Not all of us. Um, some of, some people came to our group and then learned German after speaking Yiddish, but that was definitely the exception. Um, it makes it much easier for them to understand spoken Yiddish, or for us to understand spoken Yiddish. I mean, we've all learned it partly with the help of our German, uh, most of us. But many people struggle uh, with the differences 
between the two languages. Um, so comprehensibility is high, um, but there is this diff difficulty keeping the two apart. And I always find, you know, like I have to like, when I've been speaking Yiddish all night and then I go to pay at the bar and having to switch to German, that's very difficult. Um, but also obviously our German is um, flowing into our Yiddish as well. So Deutsch so to speak, is prevalent. Um, but also there's kind of a sense that you know who are the most advanced speakers or who are the speakers who are the least influenced by German. And I would say people kind of know who their role models are um, and you know which words you might want to take up from someone. And if you recognize it and it sounds very German, then you wouldn't necessarily introduce that word into your vocabulary. Um, turnover. So we've got many short-term Berliners in our community. Uh, I would say one semester to several years. Many of us travel frequently, sometimes for months on end, uh, especially the musicians. Sustainability requires constant outreach because people are coming and going. Um, and we have many Yiddish speaking visitors passing through um, as guests, um, maybe for a week or, or a month. Um, so here's the geography of, of uh, the city for us. So um, the Yiddish activities are mostly clustered in the geographically eastern central Berlin. I'm not talking about the old east-west division, but just geographically, um, especially Kreuzberg and Neukölln. Um, people use public transportation and bikes. Nobody is, is um, driving to our meetings. Um, and we have a very good, mostly, public transportation system, which runs about till about 10 30 a.m on weekdays um, and also many of us get around by bike on the very flat streets um, distance is definitely a factor for people who live on the outskirts of the city or the western edge because we don't really meet on the west um, but for most of us the meetings are at most 30 to 45 minutes away by subway or bike um, still there's this concept called keetsiness in berlin <laughs> maybe that's yeah i don't know what language that is but keetsiness is is the gen general tendency to be lazy and not want to leave your own neighborhood. Um, so many people would not leave their general area of Berlin to cross the city on a weeknight and would only attend events relatively close for them. For example, right now it is about minus eight degrees Celsius or 70, 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And a lot of people don't even want to go outside. <laughs> okay, social life in Berlin. Um, so the, there's this concept of a Stammtisch, which is an old German concept uh, from German pubs, but it's kind of different in Berlin. Uh, a lot of people will meet at a bar um, with a specific group, like either a professional group, like people who have the same kind of job or the same sort of interest. And it's really normal to have a Stammtisch in Berlin that you hang out with often once a month, often on a particular day of the month. So that sort of idea of meeting, meeting up with people in an informal setting um, socially, who you have something in common with already exists here. Um, there's a relaxed bar and cafe culture, uh, which is very distinct from the better known party scene. So people hear about Berlin clubs and going out all night and doing lots of drugs and all of that. That does exist, but it's different from the, the kind of situation where people go to a bar and just hang out over a beer. People are not drinking to get drunk, um, necessarily. Um, and it is normal to hang out in public uh, in various places at different ages. It's not like some places where, for example, in the UK, I know it's very unusual to see someone over 25 at certain kinds of bars. It's not really like that here. Um, and, and like I said, drinking on a weeknight is more civilized. And it's also common to order tea at a bar and really no one will judge you if you're not drinking alcohol. Um, there are stage of life differences in what the way people socialize, and that's kind of difficult to get around. Um, as the organizer, I'm sure I am catering more to people like myself. You know, I'm a gay man in my 30s. I, I socialize differently from, uh, you know, a straight person in their 30s with children, for example. Um, but there are these kind of, yeah, th these kinds of um, um, differences that are very difficult to um, to bridge especially I would say between parents and of young children and other adults, even the same age, um, because uh, children really change your schedule. And it's, it's, it's difficult 
to um, to accommodate those two groups um, in terms of scheduling. Uh, Shmuis and Vine. Okay, so now getting more specifically to our own group, um, which means chat and wine, if, if you're here and don't speak Yiddish. Um, so as I said, after studying Yiddish intensively online during the pandemic, I wanted to finally speak it in person, but I barely knew anyone locally and was not connect, connected to the Berlin Yiddish scene that I just told you about. Um, but I did find the website of Yiddish Berlin and wanted to connect with them. So on January 13th, 2022, I messaged their Facebook group to ask whether there was an in-person Schmuskreis or conversation group in Berlin or if we could organize one. I'd already been part of uh, a couple of small Zoom-based Schmuskreis with people I met online. Mm -hmm. Um, so Katya Kuznetsova replied and said there wasn't one, but there are plenty of Yiddish speakers in town and we should start one. Our first meeting, uh, so we, we, we met for coffee and we talked about it and then we planned to start it or, or to have one meeting. So our first meeting was on February 17th, 2022 at the office of a translators collective. Um, four of us showed up. Originally, it was supposed to be at a wine bar, which is where the name Shmuis and Vine came from. That was Katya's idea. Um, we, we had our second meeting at that wine bar, which is when the five people who came decided to meet twice a month. Um, we publicized the first meetings on Facebook and used a sign-up form. Later, once we had our first uh, members, we switched mostly to word of mouth with occasional public announcements and a few public meetings during exhibitions. So like I said, we have these exhibitions um, with a lot of events. So um, sometimes we would make Shmuis into an event. At the second meeting, uh, we decided to meet twice a month and created a WhatsApp chat group to communicate amongst ourselves only in Yiddish. Um, so the whole group is all in Yiddish, mostly in Oisius, but some people write in Galchis. Um, I've actually been thinking about making a second group where everyone writes using the Latin alphabet. Maybe that'd be more um, accessible, something to think about <laughs> for other organizers. Um, it was a slow start. So this is also really important to keep in mind. Um, we had four to five people at each meeting for the first three months, even though we knew a lot more people, but they didn't come. So only at the seventh meeting, which was public, um, and during a Yiddish Berlin exhibition, um, do we build some momentum and start attracting a larger crowd? Um, and you'll see some of those pictures later. Many of the people who came had never spoken Yiddish outside a classroom and were intimidated. Over the past two years, we've met a total of 44 times. The 45th meeting is tomorrow. And the group keeps expanding as we find more Yiddish speakers in Berlin. Currently, we have 90 people between our WhatsApp group and email list. Of course, they don't all attend at once, and some of them have never actually attended yet, but all of them asked to be added. Also, some of them have left Berlin, and we, we don't take them off the list if they leave. Um, okay, so a bit about the format. So the basics are, um, it's just open-ended chatting. There's no format. It's, we're just hanging out and chatting. Um, there's no set theme or schedule. We don't have a, you know, today we're doing this at this time. Um, it's Yiddish only, uh, so people aren't allowed to speak other other languages. That's the only rule. Sometimes people go outside for a smoke and then they'll speak another language, but then I come outside and then they'll switch. <laughs> but speaking outside in English or German is fine. Um, it's okay. Uh, if we if we if someone doesn't know a word, a more advanced speaker will tell tell them the word, or we have the dictionary um, and they will look it up. So other elements, we've got the dictionary on the table. I always bring it, it's huge, um, but it's kind of, I'll show you. Um, yeah. I always bring, I think uh, I think we have a Vishwanath in the house, so I, I should say it's always been this dictionary. It's great. Um, and we have digital ones, but I, I think it's really good to have the physical copy so that everyone's not on their phone. Um, and then we always take a group photo. Um, I think, Fear of missing out or FOMO is a huge, super important um, organizing principle to get more people to come. If you think that all of your friends were having a good time and you didn't show up and then you see a photo, um, it makes you want to come the next time. <laughs> so I, I also tried to do a little bit with that um, when I was promoting this event to make people feel like they'd miss out. Um, and hopefully it worked. 
Um, it's consistent. I think it's important for whatever the format to be, to be recognizable um, so that people know what they're coming to. Um, and, um, but we also have had many variations um, to mix it up. And the sustainability is really important because if you're going to keep on meeting very often, you don't want to have a huge amount of work each time. Um, otherwise, the, whoever's doing it is going to burn out very quickly. So it's important to have it simple enough um, that each meeting does not require very much preparation. Uh, timing. So we normally meet 7 p.m. till around midnight, but people come and go um, uh, on a weeknight and at a bar or could be another place. No one's on time but me. I try to be on time. Uh, people show up and leave all night. Um, and I always change which weekday it is because there's some people who can never come on a Tuesday, some people can never come on a Wednesday, and so forth. So I try to keep that in mind um, um, within reason. I, I generally don't like meeting on the weekends, and there are a few people who are Shomer Shabbos. Um, so, so there are some limits um, based on that. Um, discrepancies in people's weekly schedules, as I said. Lately, we've been varying the schedule much more. Um, we've been experimenting with other options, um, especially to um, cater better to, to uh, people who have younger children um, and can't really come on weekday evenings. Occasion, we'll also do a short schmooze before another event. Um, which is also a way of attracting people to the event because you say, oh, we're going to have a little schmooze, and then afterwards, everyone stick around for the event. Um, this was the Shuttle Berlin had their uh, festival, and they included a schmooze. Um, we always call them schmooses. I know it just means conversation, but it's in English, it's come to mean a meeting of our group. Um, uh, yes, as part of their schedule. So special activities, um, see, these are some of the most common, but they happen often spontaneously. Sing-alongs with or without instruments, in Yiddish, of course. Games, chess, Yiddish board games, 20 questions. Uh, and then some more organized activities, uh, which are usually kind of a special meeting. So um, this was a picnic, but it was actually mostly at night. You'll see a picture later. Um, this was a third Seder or Salon evening uh, during Cholomoed Passover. Um, so uh, people brought poems and songs and we looked at the old Bundes Haggadah and we did various activities um, that were Passover themed, but everyone had already, everyone who was going to a Seder had already been to one. Um, this was Swimming at the Lake, organized by my friend uh, Ro, uh, Ro van Bingerden, and I'm sorry that my Dutch pronunciation is not good. Um, so she organized it and um, uh, designed the poster. Um, uh, Jordan, uh, my friend Jordan Schnee in the group, um, he found a bar that was also having figure drawing one night. And so some of the people who came to the Schmuis then also went into the room that was doing the figure, figure drawing and they, they drew some of the models. Um, one time we found ourselves spontaneously writing a song together. Um, it was a cover of Barbie Girl, but about a recent news story, a lioness that had been discovered living in the woods outside Berlin. We decided she was a lesbian looking for love and brainstormed the lyrics to match the tune. Um, I'm not gonna sing it. <laughs> uh, and during my travels, I travel a lot myself. I've also organized satellite Shmuis meetups in New York, Tel Aviv, uh, Warsaw, and Krakow. Um, along some kind of similar model, but with obviously different people. And Jordan Schnee organized one in Paris. Um, communication. So, um, so this is basically how, how do, mostly how do I communicate with the group? Because I'm mostly the coordinator. Um, although other people, as you've seen, have uh, organized individual schmooses and, and it is a group. It's not just a, you know, but yeah, I basically do the coordination. Um, so we have a WhatsApp chat group um, where I, I send out um, the announcement uh, every two weeks and then sometimes reminders there, but also people use it to chat about all sorts of things as long as it's in Yiddish. Um, they might ask for if anyone knows an apartment available or 
um, various other things or just announcing each other's events. Um, we also, I also have an email list um, for people who don't have WhatsApp, um, which I send out um, an email announcing each meeting. Um, and then uh, some other social media, I was posting the, the posters on, on Twitter for a while, but leaving out the location. But I think we've only ever had one person come through that and I don't really use Twitter so much anymore. Um, the main thing that's most important is personal reminders. And this, is, this takes the most work. Um, I write to a lot of people individually um, on a regular basis, not every single meeting, but um, I try to keep them in the fold and I try to remind them what it is. A lot of people have the WhatsApp muted or they can't read Yiddish very quickly. Um, so they don't catch all the announcements. Um, promotion, uh, digital flyers, I'll show you these in a bit. Um, networking and other Yiddish related and Jewish gatherings. So um, I personally go to a lot of Yiddish related things and I'm always talking about our group so people hear about it, but also anyone in the group could tell someone else about it. So there's a lot of kind of word of mouth um, and, um, and that brings momentum um, as more people find out about it. Um, also email newsletters, other people's email newsletters, if, if, if they have a, an organization with similar interests, um, they might include an announcement, especially if we're doing a special event. Um, and Facebook and, and, and the Yiddish Berlin website. Um, okay, so here are a few of my uh, um, flyers. Starting at the fourth meeting, I've created a digital announcement poster for every meeting, except for a few that other people made. <laughs> Um, for example, when I'm traveling. Um, over time, the style evolved and I experimented with different mediums like photographs and collages. Sometimes I spend more time on it, other times I do it in an hour, but the idea is to make each meeting special and unique. Um, there are often some combination of digital and, an, and analog. Um, in this case, I added the text to the paper in Photoshop. Um, I definitely think it's probably too much work. <laughs> But I enjoy the creative outlet because I'm not actually an artist. Um, so it's my main artistic activity is making these posters. Um, the idea is to make each meeting special and unique in some way. So it's not just a routine. Um, this one was a collage. Um, this was a, a charcoal drawing that I flipped uh, the black and white. Uh, another collage. And um, this was an AI image uh, for Hanukkah <laughs> with, with fish. And this last one was a digitally altered issue of the Forberts from the 1970s, but I changed it to say Shmuelis and Vine with the, the date of our, of our next meeting. Um, attendance. So it typically varies uh, between about 5 and 15. Um, there are cycles, is seasonal uh, momentum, depending on who's in town. We had one big meeting, maybe the next meeting will be big. We had one small meeting and there was like a picture of three people, then maybe the next one will be small. Um, but it, it's always changing, so I try not to get disheartened. And also, um, yeah, it's nice. the small ones are nice too. Um, posting our group photos to the WhatsApp chat group really helps encourage people to attend next time. Um, demographics, we're mostly 25 to 45, uh, some older adults, rarely any children, although as I said, some parents. Um, Native languages, English, German, Russian, Hebrew, Ukrainian, Polish, Dutch, I think Danish, and probably a few more. Very few native Yiddish speakers and none among the regulars. Um, there are some, uh, yeah, there are some, some older native Yiddish speakers um, who have occasionally come. There are some uh, people who, who left the Hasidic community and live in Germany, but they mostly live in other cities like, like Dresden or Leipzig. Um, we have a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish uh, people in the group. Um, and along with that, there are different reasons for learning Yiddish. So um, I would say uh, for those of us who are Jewish, obviously it has a lot to do with our own personal um, relationship with the language. Um, uh, and getting in touch with your roots. Um, various people have different uh, attitudes, but also many people are drawn to Yiddish literature or they're interested in the local history of the place that they're from. So people from Eastern Europe who aren't Jewish, who are in our group, um, some of them actually live in places with a lot of Jewish, uh, came from places with a lot of Jewish history. 
Um, but yeah, it really varies. Um, and, and we, and we want to be a place that's open for anyone as long as they speak Yiddish. Um, people's Yiddish educational background varies. Um, we have people who have a PhD in Yiddish. Uh, we have people who have maybe attended one class, but somehow can get by. Uh, maybe if they already speak German and Hebrew, like that combination. Um, but uh, but people, the way that people learned and um, and what they're bringing uh, with them is 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 quite a, a mix. And then there's some heritage speakers as well, um, uh, who who remember it from their parents or grandparents. Um, like I said, mostly Berliners by choice or shorter term residents. Venues and locations. Um, so we move around bars, cafes, parks, occasionally a private home or courtyard. We tend to return to the same venues every month or two. We build relationships with them. Sometimes I decide a venue isn't working anymore and I take it out of rotation um, or we find new ones. None of our venues charge us money. We pay by buying drinks. In a city like New York, for example, that might be very difficult to do at a bar. Um, I think uh, so some some cities you wouldn't have such easy access to space and be able to spend that much time um, in a bar. Uh, you have to figure that for yourself. We rotate neighborhoods to attract members living closer to different places. Um, the criteria are quiet, not too crowded, possible to stay all night. Um, I always reserve in advance to play it safe. Uh, it is hard to navigate reservations because our numbers are unpredictable and we arrive at different times. Language skills. Uh, so our, our yeah, so smoothest versus language class, I would say it's not a language class. Um, and so we want it to be kind of a relaxed environment um, and, you know, not correcting people all the time, but like offering them help if they ask for it. Um, and also for the people who are teachers who have attended, you know, um, they don't need to feel like they're on, on duty. Um, like I said, we have the dictionary on table. I went through a bunch of old pictures and I found the dictionary <laughs> in all these different group photos. Um, so yeah, you can see it really was there in, in one, at least in one case it's being used at the time. Um, there's a question about the minimum level to participate, uh, minimum language level, I mean. Um, I would say I usually try to play it by ear. If someone speaks, so if, if someone speaks German and they've taken even a beginning Yiddish class, I'll probably let them come. If, especially if they also speak Hebrew or a Slavic language. Like, I, I feel like you, I, I kind of, have to play it by ear. There are definitely some people who are occasionally speaking basically German with a Yiddish accent, and it is a bit difficult to um, to navigate that. Um, but I would say, especially outside of a German speaking context, you would want to have at least intermediates. Um, but it is important for, in my perspective, um, not so much that everyone is at the same level, but that you have at least two fluent or very conversational speakers who can carry the conversation forward because otherwise it becomes very awkward if you have a, a big group of mostly beginners and maybe only one um advanced speaker like for example i always come first and if someone's coming for the first time and they're still just starting to learn sometimes that conversation can be difficult but the minute another advanced speaker comes it's a lot easier to, to keep the conversation flowing. And the beginners tend to be quieter, but that's totally fine. Um, they learn a lot by listening. Um, as I said, German is a blessing and a curse. People think they speak Yiddish, they might not, um, but it definitely helps them understand if they, if they uh, do speak German. Not everyone speaks German. Um, and having different native languages helps. And this is something that's probably true everywhere. If everyone is a native English speaker, or everyone's a native, Russian speaker or whatever it is, and you naturally would want to speak in the language that is shared, um, it's going to feel more artificial. But for us, we all have different languages. Some of us speak individually, like I will speak German with a certain person outside of the Shmuelis, but I would speak English with a different person. And then there's other people who speak Russian with each other, which I don't speak Russian. So like for us, Sometimes Yiddish really is the common language, and that's something specific to Berlin, and I think it really does help. Um, 
But if you live in a place that also has, you know, it has a more Anglophone Jewish community and a more post-Soviet Jewish community, it's a really good idea to bring those two groups together um, because that creates almost a language barrier that helps you speak Yiddish. Uh, guests and visitors. Um, so advantages of inviting visitors, it's language input and a reality check. Are we actually speaking German with a Yiddish accent or are we really speaking Yiddish? Um, when we have the visitors, we, you know, we're, we're communicating with other people who haven't been coming to the same meetings all the time. Um, and we just hear different ways of saying things. It's a special occasion. It's a talking point for my reminders. Um, it spreads the word because people visit us and then they go away and they say, I went to this really cool thing in Berlin, um, you know, and hopefully we, we should do it here, but um, that hasn't happened. So that, that's one of the reasons I made this workshop because I wanted more people to consider doing this kind of, of group elsewhere. Um, so yeah, some of our visitors have been Yiddish professors, translators, native speakers, artists, and activists, and it's always interesting to talk about them, whatever it is they're doing. Um, and I'll often schedule a meeting specifically knowing that someone's coming um, and, and make it uh, coincide with their visit. Um, roles. So up front, I should say, so Katya and I started this together and, um, and she fairly soon had to go on maternity leave and she had a very different schedule for me. Um, so I've basically been the main organizer for most of the time that this has been happening. Um, and I would really suggest anyone else who does this uh, or does some similar related project to divide the roles better than, so I, this is not something that is like a really good role model, so to speak. Um, but I'll tell you what the tasks are that could be divided. So the main organizational tasks, planning the dates, reserving the venues, um, illustrating and sending the announcements. I wouldn't recommend making them so complicated as my as my posters, but I just love it. Um, be on time in case someone else is. So one person has to be there at the beginning, um, even if you have a more rolling attendance, um, just to make sure that a new person especially um, doesn't arrive alone and, and feel lost. Um, recruiting and welcoming new members, that is a whole big process. Um, sending personal reminders, um, yeah, and also keep just keeping in touch with people. You don't want people can kind of come once or twice and then sort of disappear. And if you don't write to them, they might not come again. Um, but if you keep on writing to them every few months, maybe they'll show up again and, and get back into it. Um, like I said, this is an area of improvement. It's much too centralized right now. Um, I'm a bit of a monarch, and I don't want to be a monarch. But like you know, in the actual events. Um, uh, it is definitely not a hierarchical situation, or at least I would like to think it isn't. Um, um, yeah, so there, and there are other organizers um, who have organized meetings um, at other times. Sometimes they're just independently organized a shmuis that isn't officially a shmuis and vine shmuis, and then they don't, you know, involve me in it. But like, this is already a format now that people are playing with. They're just having a Shabbat dinner together in Yiddish or um you know just hanging out and going to a concert in Yiddish and, and that's and that's great and you know I think it's really important for whoever's organizing it not to feel that they have a monopoly on it um and and to be flexible um I say that and people would say I'm not flexible enough but you know um I'm, I'm admitting it uh drama um I think it's also really important to um be aware that these kinds of communities these kinds of smo small close to communities um, have drama <laughs> everywhere in the world. I think there's never been a Yiddish community that didn't have drama of some kind. Um, so I think you need to plan for it um, and you know have really good communication among the people involved. Also just in general, like dividing roles and just being as fair as possible and, and trying not to neglect anyone's needs. Um, it will still probably be unavoidable that there'll be some kind of Conflict, um, between people, um, but it's it's good to plan for it because um, you know I've seen this all around the world. Like even one breakup of, of a power couple in the Yiddish world can create um, real ripples. <laughs> Special events and collaborations. Um, third Seder, I mentioned that combining shmuis with events, satellite meetups. Um, I think I've mentioned all this in another slide. Um, 
Okay, so these are my lessons. This is what these are my takeaways that I would give you um, for um, things that we do that I think we've done well that you could copy, which I'm inviting you to copy if you want, um, in whatever version um, that anyone else would like to organize. Um, so one is name your group. Don't just call it a Shmuz Prize. Come up with a name. It makes it, it gives it an identity and makes it more fun. It doesn't have to be Shmuz and Vine. Like you should come up with your own name. Um, treat meetings like events. So it's not just like our today's Thursday. It's like something special, even though we're pretty pretty much doing the same thing. We're just hanging out and chatting. Um, it's it's an event. Um, so part of that is I number them, and I've been numbering them from the beginning. And then you know also you it's motivating, and you say, oh, I've already got to number forty four, and next one's number forty five, and then when we get to one hundred, we'll be really happy. So it's a really easy thing to do. Just have to keep track of how many you've had. Um, I think the chat group has been really great also in terms of keeping things more democratic and, and not so hierarchical. Um, people can chat with each other and they can find each other. Um, I think WhatsApp is not as common in the US as a medium, but maybe Facebook chat or some something else. This will also depend on your demographics and how people tend to communicate. Um, I think it's nice that it's open to all Yiddish speakers and not just a specific predefined group of people um, who got together. A lot of normal Shmuel's Kreisen are a specific group and it's kind of invitation only, but in our group, anyone who speaks Yiddish is welcome, um, no matter who they are. And um, yeah, and it's free to participate. We don't charge anything. Um, I don't think this particular format should be, should cost money. Um, I, I think I think it's a community. It's not it's not a, a service. Um, and you know, of course, I've been doing this for free. But um, but I, I got a grant to give this workshop. <laughs> um, it's a Yiddish only space. Um, that's important. I think it's really important not to not to um, to switch back and forth languages within the space. So if it's just a question of going out for a smoking break and speaking Yiddish, speaking English outside, then at least you're somehow defining where the space is. Um, so we have public venues. That's another way that people feel more comfortable. Um, uh, you know, they're they're not going to someone's house who they don't know. They're going somewhere public where where they're um, comfortable um, and, and it's kind of on an even level, even though they don't know the people as well as they know each other. Um, the group photos, I just think they're great. I think it's nice to document it. Um, and doing activities, outings, and special events is just a nice way to keep mixing it up. Um, things to avoid coming next. Um, and again, all this, I'll, I'll be sending these, uh, these slides to you um, by email so you don't need to write everything down. Um, avoid time consuming preparation. Don't create an art project for yourself. Don't create like giant you know, tasks that aren't necessary. Um, avoid overly centralized responsibilities, mea culpa, exclusiveness. Try not to make it seem too clubby. Like it should be a place that everyone feels welcome. Um, try to avoid disadvantaging or excluding certain demographics. Um, we do the best we can. I think maybe sometimes older people feel a bit less comfortable because of the average age being younger um, or, you know, issues about, uh, um, you know, the difference, differences between parents' schedules, as I mentioned. Um, but, uh, but I would like to think that we try to accommodate different, um, different demographics. Like I said, uh, try to avoid interpersonal drama, uh, especially now, try to avoid political or religious arguments. Um, this, this is something that can very easily um, uh, break down social groups. Avoid switching languages. Uh, avoid, I would say avoid doing this project if you don't have enough advanced speakers. First, find the advanced speakers, make sure you have a quorum and that you can at least get two of them to commit to coming every, to every meeting. Otherwise, there really is a danger that the, what, what people will be speaking is not actually Yiddish, especially here in Germany. <laughs> um, forgetting to check in with people, I think it is sad when people um, kind of get forgotten or, or, or um, fall by the wayside because uh, you haven't checked in with them. 
and burnout. I think it's really important to avoid burnout. I've I've had my moments, but I'm I'm still doing this. And and um, like I said, I would like to uh, divide the tasks somehow more widely. Considerations for planning and local specifics. Um, so things that I mentioned when I was talking about Berlin that would be different in your place. Geography and transportation. Uh, where is the best place to meet? Uh, how can they get home? If you know, if you meet at a time and then there's no way to get home after that time, that's a problem. Timing, daily and weekly schedules. Venue, where do people usually so socialize? Maybe where you live or with your group of people and demographics, a bar is a bad idea. Um, you know, I also know like there's people who don't drink alcohol and would not be comfortable around it. And that's unfortunately something we can't really uh, accommodate, although um, people don't have to order alcohol, obviously. Um, demographics uh, appeal to different subgroups. Um, uh, covered that before. Language skills, think about who can attend. Um, doesn't need to be so so hard and fast, but you should you should think about it. Sustainability, coming up with the format that you think you can repeat a bunch of times, or um, or if you no longer are able to do it, setting yourself up so that you are able to pass it on to someone else. Um, keeping in mind the momentum and cycles, knowing that um, I've ha had people told me tell me that they had a Shmuis Kreis and they met four times and it just didn't take off. And hours took off after the seventh time. So if they had waited three more times, maybe, <laughs> you know, but it, it takes a while. And, and, and the, first, the first meetings were really hard. Like I was like, is this ever gonna work? But for whatever reason, we kept trying. Um, think about roles, like I said, um, haven't done the best job of that. And um, partnerships and connections. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. There's other people who already know everyone, who already understand your y Yiddish ecosystem, um, uh, and who have been doing this kind of organizing. You don't want to feel like you're organizing this behind someone's back. You want to feel like you're you're complementing what's already there and and working together with it and 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 collaborating with them. Um, you know, depending on what's there. Okay, so um, this part is uh, photos and videos, and um, like I already admitted, I didn't obtain proper individual permission from each person, although these were photos that we all knew we were taking publicly. Um, so I'm taking them out of the, um, the final recording that will be going out, and, um, and if you're watching that final recording now, you can just imagine how much fun we're having. Um, they're really great. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So here are some blurry photos from our second meeting where we established the basic format. Um, I didn't take any photos of the first meeting. Um, this is the sixth meeting. We still couldn't get more than five people together at the time, but we were enjoying ourselves. And this is the seventh meeting at the gallery during a Yiddish Berlin exhibition. Um, and it was a breakthrough with 12 people, which is when the momentum really started. So the next meeting, this is the eighth meeting, you can already see the momentum happening in my friend Laura's courtyard. Um, once you have more than five or six people, you can have more than one conversation happening in parallel, which often feels much more natural. Um, and in this case, the Yiddish teacher, Karol Wegener, was uh, visiting from Poland, which was also a good talking point. Um, she has some friends who were there. Um, the meetings since then have varied in size. Um, this was in a basement of a bookstore um, shortly before the, the Yiddish summer program. Um, so we already had a few guests who had arrived early for the summer program. Um, often there'll be cycles of a couple months with smaller groups followed by a couple months with larger ones, um, depending on the momentum, people's travels and various factors. Um, you can see there I am with my dog in the background. <laughs> Um, and we actually had a native Yiddish speaker that time, which was very exciting. I think it was the first time. Um, yeah, just a few more, a few more pictures. You can see the dictionaries on the table. Someone just looked something up. This, um, and I try not to get too discouraged when it's small. Some people prefer a smaller group and we get to know each other better. Um, this was just last month. Um, some people also prefer hanging out with people they know already. Although recruitment takes some balance to keep a mix of regulars, visitors, and new people, and um, and I think uh, thinking about 
extroverts and introverts is is an important organizing factor uh, as well. I'm an extrovert, and and um, sometimes I forget that it's not you know everyone's cup of tea to meet a lot of strangers over and over again. This was the biggest meeting ever uh, during the Meta and Yiddish summer program. About 40 people came and it turned into a huge street party and it was great. Everyone was speaking Yiddish on the streets of Berlin. Um, it was such an amazing night. Um, yeah, so that was two years ago and they're coming back this summer. So I'm hoping we can have another one. And I think actually some of the people in this audience are in that photo. <laughs> Um, here we are playing various games in Yiddish. Uh, apples to apples on the left. Um, Shtetl, the board game. Chess and foosball. Um, if you are interested in Yiddish board games, I highly recommend anytime someone goes to New York, sending them to Brooklyn to buy board games. The board games work pretty well, even though like the Yiddish is a bit different. Um, and uh, although I would say Shtetl, the board game, is terribly designed. Don't buy it. <laughs> Um, in general, we're a playful group of people. Last jan January, this happened spontaneously with some leftover New Year's balloons. Um, and you can't hear it, but the, they turned into a, a language game because they started coming up with different categories of words. And whenever you touched the balloon, you had to say like a different animal in Yiddish or a different food or something like that. Um, this, you can see a little bit of Berlin bike culture. Um, when um, two of us were leaving, leaving uh, the Schmuis. Yeah. Forza, yeah, so the mansion was a Yeah, so that's a cargo bike. A lot of a lot of parents take their kids to uh, to school or kindergarten in those yeah. bikes. Um, and this is an example of us playing music together uh, at one of our meetings. Um, it probably wasn't our best singing, but it was very fun. And only certain places actually allow us to sing or have a piano or, um, yeah, so we like to take advantage of those occasions. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of spontaneous Yiddish sing-alongs. Um, this was supposed to be a shmuis by the lake, but it was rained out, um, and Daniel Kahn was visiting from Hamburg with his son. So they started playing. I wasn't there. I, I, wish, I, I wish I was there. Um, and this was a little nighttime picnic. You can see everyone's bikes. Um, this was a Yiddish-speaking weekday lunch break last month near the Jewish Museum where several Yiddish speakers work. Um, this meeting was more accessible for some people who were less available in the evenings, and um, we were all amazed at how how many people came. Um, and it was just for for a quick lunch, but it was it was really fun. And this was the satellite meetup in New York last February. Um, I just reserved a table at a bar in um, in Brooklyn, and uh, some people there um, spread the word, and, and, it, and it went really well. Um, this was in Tel Aviv. I knew three of the people from the Berlin Yiddish Summer Program, so there's kind of always connections like that way. Um, and this was in Warsaw. Um, we met at a restaurant and continued to a private apartment. Um, it's mostly spoke Yiddish. And this was in Krakow during the Yiddish Cultural Festival there. Um, and uh, also very well attended. And I would really recommend for those of you who attend these kinds of Jewish cultural festivals or conferences, it would be very easy to organize this kind of gathering there because there will always be enough Yiddish speakers. So all you have to do is kind of spread the word that you're going to be at JTS or you're going to be at, you know, Yiddish New York or whatever. It would be really easy to um, to to get a room of people together speaking Yiddish. Um, and that's basically what I did at this festival. Everyone was there for the festival. All right. So that is my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and um, 
now is the time. I haven't seen the chat, but um, if you want to ask any questions for well, me. Judy, I will ask everyone to unmute. You can now unmute. Uh, there's been a lively discussion in the last few minutes about varieties of um, uh, schmooze events in different communities that people have been talking about in terms of uh, different way, different platforms to use and whether people uh, have to RSVP and what kind of events there are. So, but I don't think there have been questions in uh in chat, uh, but people can now unmute and ask questions. Please I think I actually. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hi, this is Sherry. I'm down in South Florida. Um, the reason I asked about RSVPing is because 99.9% .9 of us live in associations that are gated. So if we had anybody come to the house, we would need their names in advance. So spontaneity is not a big thing here mm -hmm. when they decide to come. And when you go make a reservation at a venue, they're not asking you to guarantee X amount of money each person should spend. Uh, first of all, I don't know how to see, I can't see who's talking. It nice oh, it's Sherry Smith. My camera's off because I'm sick as a dog. And I oh, okay, that's fine. Then that's why I can't see you. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I would say this is the kind of thing that you would really need to adapt to the way that people socialize in South Florida. Like, it's not going to be the same as the way people socialize. Not at all. Um, so when you see the way that we gather and it looks really foreign to you, that's a sign that you really need to do some kind of... Um, conceptual strategizing and say well um we would need rscps or is there is it possible to maybe meet at a restaurant the first time if there's people you've never met before and then take it to someone's house on a future meeting or you know i, I think there's different ways to to adjust um Basically, any way that people would meet new people or friends of friends, um, you know, you should just kind of match the way that um, that your community socializes would be my recommendation. Our community is three counties. My nonprofit works three counties and it's Yiddish Kite Initiative. So mm -hmm. our schmoozes are in English with Yiddish words in them. We're right. trying to get more Yiddish classes together and more total Yiddish speaking but you're looking at a hundred mile radius yeah. for classes. So we're trying to put it in the middle County <laughs> and, and we do little floats around, but I love the concept of this. I love that it's stressless for the people because there's no, Oh, I need to know something about this or I need to know something about that agenda. So it's really stressless looking at it. And that I like a lot. Um, so that we could adapt. I think we're just going to have to do it county by county and get a, yeah, a meeting point. Things. You could you could meet in one county one one time, another county another time, and the people who are really dedicated and you know able to drive, they m might make it to the one at the second county. But um, in my experience, people who live closest to the meeting are most likely to show up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for the largest communities that have Yiddish speakers and we try to book near them because we can't even get in as a nonprofit to speak in some of them. We have to go right outside because everything's gated. So we're trying, we're, we, our, our schmoozes are mostly English. So we do schmoozes, we do like bagels and schmooze. And then we have to charge, but it's, it's interesting. I like what you did. You'd I, another possibility is if you're already having, you're already organizing gatherings, maybe you could have an area of the gathering for people who actually do speak Yiddish. And then like they can drift back and forth and speak English some of the time. And, but like know that when they're in this section, um, that's it's Yiddish. Speak Yiddish. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're doing a play be. reading 
in March um, of a Shalom Aleichem play, and they're going to read acts in English and acts in the original Yiddish, and then do commentary on it. So I could break it off afterwards. That was really good. I could break it off afterwards and have them have a Yiddish corner. <laughs> okay, that would be really good. Thank you so much for that. Other questions? Uh, Mina Lifsha has her hand up, but uh, hi, Mina. Hi, hi, Jake. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's always um, it's always really hard to stay in touch with all the Yiddish things that are happening around the world. So it's great to hear what's happening in Berlin. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing that kind of was woven throughout your presentation, but I don't think you really mentioned it explicitly, which is um, it's so great that you're meeting in public places. And so even people who don't you know, aren't coming for your event, but happen to be around, um, you know, here Yiddish is a living language. It's not just for the people in the group um, that are getting used to the idea as a living language. It's, you know, random people walking around and be like, wait, is that Yiddish that I hear? And maybe it's less common in Germany because they might just hear it's, oh, it sounds like a German dialect. Maybe it's just a dialect. I don't know. But here in the U.S., when we've had events that are in Yiddish in just public spaces, sometimes, you know, you have people come up to you and be like, oh, are you speaking Yiddish? Is that still a thing? You know, um, and so I, I, I love that public aspect of what you're doing. We've had some really interesting conversations with all kinds of people at these bars. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and also the, the, the bars themselves that are that are hosting us are really amused that this exists. You know, it's like we're educating them on a sort of individual level. Um, so thank you so much for that comment. And yeah, and it does feel a bit like a, a kind of an activist thing to put Yiddish in public. Yeah, my, one of that was one of the things my grandfather actually, uh, Martha Chef, that used to encourage his students to do was not just speak Yiddish in the classroom, but on the subway on your way to the classroom, right? And just kind of integrate into your daily life. So I appreciate that. Nice. Uh, Rebecca has her hand up. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Rebecca Orifka. I'm based in Washington, DC. And I have a few friends here who speak Yiddish. Specifically, I had two, one already moved away. But when I had two good friends who spoke Yiddish, I was like, why don't we make a meetup? And I made a graphic and I advertised it. And only my two friends showed up. So <laughs> my question is, how do you reach people who you don't already know who might not already be linked to a Yiddish community. I happen to grow our, we have a WhatsApp group chat and I happen to grow it because I was mutual to someone on Twitter who was, who I saw was sending Yiddish and she met some, another guy at a Klezmer show who was like, I want to speak Yiddish in person. I've only ever taught it to myself. So now we've grown a little bit, but that was like very lucky. Otherwise I'm like, I'm sure that there are some people around who are maybe um, heritage Yiddish speakers or took a class here or there but I don't know how to reach them and I don't know how to find them. So if you have any advice on that, that's my question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my way that I go about it is just by being an extrovert and going to lots of things that where like people like me gather. And then over time, I don't know, people have heard they they know that I'm the person to talk to about Yiddish <laughs> or that I'm the person who ca can't stop talking about Yiddish. Um, and that helps. Like it, it, it's like the friends of friends who then tell you, Oh, I found, I met this Yiddish speaker or my boss speaks Yiddish or something. And then it like, uh, it gets there, back to you. This is Judy. There are four suggest. There are five suggestions in chat. Um, uh, Sarah Miriam, wants to say there's a whole Baltimore group that could connect you with people. Zach I see. I'm reading them. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone knows you can save the chat by clicking in the lower right-hand side. It only saves from when you got on the event. So they are good. There's lots of information there. Um, Hani had a question. Is, is that right? Hani? Talia was the oh, one. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I was just curious. I mean, someone touched on this earlier about like uh, mm -hmm. uh, people in the bars or how do they react or if there's any like kind of explicit, um, maybe anti-Semitic things that happen and then how do you deal with it? Um, really curious about 
keeping the safe, the space, you know, kind of enclosed um, and making sure the people involved feel good. And I'll probably ask you about these stories with the bar as well later. But thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Thanks so much for coming. Um, yeah, I, I would say we've we've been very lucky. We haven't had um we really haven't had any kind of anti-semitic uh experiences since we started doing this um and i you know never say never like you know knock on wood i i i don't i don't know how to go about it but i think the the approach that, that i've personally taken um which i don't know how much I would revise now, given the current environment, um, is is really to 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 try to um, be more visible and um, and through greater visibility, um, hopefully normalize it. Um, you know, um, Moishala, uh, who's next to me in my version, uh, Moishala Fonzer just wrote an article about this in the Forbes. It's, uh, it's in Yiddish. Um, but uh, about wearing a, wearing a yarmulke in public. And I think these sorts of questions are very uh, current and everyone answers them for themselves. I know uh, in the time after October 7th, I was very conscious of which areas people felt comfortable in, um, in terms of which bars to choose. Um, but I have basically now gone back to just choosing whatever bars I want. Um, I think the immediate tension uh, has changed, although there's still quite a lot going on um, in the city in which being Jewish is a very political and contested state of being. <laughs> so I don't really know how to answer that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's that. those are my off the top of the head thoughts. Um, here, here's a space from Sar, a question from Sarah Merriam in chat. Uh, there's some compliments, and then it says, "My question is, how do you hold the space for Yiddish when people come up and ask in another language what's going on and ask a bunch of questions? Good to be public, but also dot dot dot." Yeah, that is a good. That is a good question. We haven't had too many annoying people trying to get in the way. Um, it ha did has happened sometimes where there was a kind of philo-Semitic person who just thought it was so amazing that we're speaking Yiddish and she wanted to come to our meetings. It was one of the times when we were singing and like when we sing in public to get an audience, um, you know, those, those, bar, those singing situations, like other people at the bar can come over and watch. Um, but that also is something that we do when we feel comfortable somewhere. Um, uh, I don't think that people in Germany talk to strangers as much as they do in the US. So um, usually that is kind of our protecting factor. They'll like wonder, but they won't actually say anything to you. <laughs> huh. um, Jake, this is Judy. I have a question. I also want to let you know it's 27 after the hour. We can keep... Okay long as you want to stay there's still 30 participants my question is that Clus california has an online uh flesic yiddish salon and people sometimes ask if they can uh, participate just to listen because they want to hear the sound of yiddish and the co-chairs in the group have decided not to allow people to do that because they don't want people to feel like they're being they don't want Yiddish speakers of whatever level to feel like they're being watched yeah. by someone who's who's sort of just looking or listening. And, you know, the dynamics might be different in person. Oh, and if someone wants to get on the list to be invited, they have to have a Yiddish conversation with on the phone with one of the co-chairs to make sure their Yiddish is okay. I mean, the test is not very difficult, but you have to at least be able to schmooze a little bit. Yeah. But do you have any thoughts on in-person events allowing people to just listen? I would say I I really don't like gawkers. Like I've had a lot of people ask if they could just listen. 
I love, I love, I'm with Hani here. I love the schmooze test. Um, I actually haven't done that, but I think I might, I might try to do that. In general, I err on the side of allowing more people, but if someone really just wants to watch and isn't going to try um, to talk or isn't capable of, you know, really putting together a sentence, um, then no, then I wouldn't invite them. I think a lot of times, so here, because we have two somewhat mutually intelligible languages going on, it's a very different situation because people are able to like pretty much understand everything. They're not just, not everything, because obviously they're different languages, but also people are not using a huge number of Lush and words all the time. And there's a lot of context clues. Um, so it is, relatively easy for a German speaker to follow along at least and know what's happening in the conversation, which would not be the case if you were in a country um, where you're not assuming that people speak a very a very closely related language. Um, but I think it is really important. I mean, I talked a lot about German, but I think it's really, really important that we don't just pretend that they're the same language. And that is like my biggest struggle um, okay. at my group of, of making sure that people take Yiddish seriously and they take the differences seriously and, and take all the things that they don't know already seriously. Um, Maishala had his hand up. Uh, you, you need to unmute yourself, Maishala. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Jake. That was a wonderful presentation. I just wanted to... Um... To just comment about, you know, finding people who speak Yiddish. I mean, in my own personal experience many years ago, I I found a lot of people at a particular shiel, a, a synagogue that had, were Cuban Jews and they, a lot of them spoke Yiddish and I started a Yiddish binkel. I mean, it just depends on, you know, so many different demographics. And, you know, what you're doing is ske skewed more toward younger people, I would suppose, even though I'm sure there are um, elder people that come. But, you know, um, it's like... To find Yiddish speakers, sometimes we really have to uh, dig and like, I love your, the way you're saying, you know, just being out, outgoing and asking people like, I ask anybody, I'll ask, like, do you speak Yiddish? Do I see Yiddish? You know, you just got to like find the people and then, you know, find a place to meet. So I just, I loved a lot of your suggestions. I just want to mention that, that, you know, there are Yiddish speaking pockets of people, some places we just have to kind of look for them. I found someone at synagogue recently. I don't go to synagogue very often, but um, but we had, there was a kiddish and we were sitting around and singing uh, mostly Hebrew like smiras, like Hebrew table songs. Um, but I noticed that in the in the bench or in the like little booklet, um, there among all the Hebrew songs they had from Pipichik, and I was like, oh. Like, why don't we sing that? You know, it's not my favorite song, but there's a Yiddish song in there. And then we sang it. And then on the other side of the room, this guy came up to me. He was like, do that Yiddish? And it was just so, I love those moments. <laughs> but you have to kind of, you know, you, you, I know you personally, Moishala, wear your Yiddish themed t-shirts all the time, which I'm sure helps. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Wear something Yiddish on you, you will. I have tons of Yiddish t-shirts and people talk to me all the time. Yeah. Um, Kavka Nibolsky wants to know what the issue is with Lush and Kaidish, Kaidish Dika Verte. Are people avoiding it or? Um, no, I, I think we definitely use Lush and Kaidish Dika Verte. I, I, I feel like I overspoke that, that, um, thing, but I think it is possible by context clues even to, to listen around them or to learn the, if, if it's if it's just a word or two in a sentence, you can figure out what's going on. I think when when someone starts talking about a topic that features a lot of Lush and Kardish Dikuverta, like if we're discussing a Jewish holiday or something, then a native German speaker who's there will not understand. Um, but usually there's enough context clues and it's in the in, in the context of a whole conversation that we're having about a particular subject. Um, but we do have native Hebrew speakers and native German speakers and native Slavic language speakers. And so, you know, somehow the Germanic words in Yiddish are, are the common thread, but, you know, our Slavic language speakers will be more comfortable with the Slavic words and the Hebrew speakers will be more comfortable with the Lushan Kardashian words, although um, they get very confused when they mean something else in Yiddish than they do in Hebrew. <laughs> 
So yeah, I don't know. It's Orca has. I did, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. That that's that's my thought. Okay, Morta <laughs> has a question, and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Um, actually, no question, but just uh, would like to share the experience here from Frankfurt. Uh, we have, uh, let's say, a little bit of luxury problem because our group of six, seven persons, uh, I'm the only one who is not Jewish, and I'm the only one who is not a native speaker. However, it seems that I'm the only one who is really interested uh, to broaden the scope huh? um, but in the end i'm i don't feel to be in the situation i i've put out advertisements in the synagogue huh? um, in yiddish um, yeah but actually it did not fly huh? so we we somehow we don't we seem not to be able to leave that the circle and huh? five that they they know each other they are in their 70s and 80s they know each other since they are children that their whole life living in yiddish huh? but um yeah it's, it's really difficult huh? so we, we have we have had those occasional visitors but yeah they never can came back again because probably they were not not extroverted enough to uh, to blend in such a group. It's not that that easy. Huh? If uh, you are the only now, I'm the only outsider. But I didn't find the second one who wanted to be the outsider, who is actually an insider. Huh? They love me. I hope so. Huh? I love them. Uh, but yeah, we we have a problem with this diversity. Huh? We don't get it. <laughs> um. Uh, yeah, I just want to say specifically, comment? sorry? You want to make a concluding comment? Oh, a concluding comment. Well, I, I've just been very fascinated by this um, Frankfurt Schmuiskreis for a very long time. I need to go there and meet meet these people um, because it's, the, for the history of, of uh, Yiddish in Germany, it's, it's really amazing that, that this particular group of people is still speaking Yiddish this whole time. Very much welcome. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I would say as a concluding comment, so I actually had prepared some questions for the audience, but um, I think in uh, a group like this, there was plenty of discussion without them. Um, so I would just, I would just like to um, leave you with the thought that, you know, you've seen now one example of how someone and a, a group of people have built up a community of some kind um, where we speak Yiddish on a regular basis. And obviously all of these elements that I showed you in our socialize here, the way people get around, people's weekly schedules, everything is gonna be different. Um, but hopefully you can see how I went from the environment that I was in and how we gradually built it up. And I'm sure, um, um, you would not have to entirely start from scratch. Um, or if you already have a project like this, maybe you can pick up some lessons from our project um, that would be useful for your own. Or um, just take inspiration. Know that uh, it took us seven sessions before um, before we got past that first, uh, you know, kind of plateau. Um, and a lot of people don't make it past, you know, people don't try something seven times. They just give up after the second or third time. Um, but in order to get the word of mouth and the momentum, you really have to keep trying at least seven times, you know, it's, it's a manageable number. <laughs> uh, Jake, this has been a wonderful presentation. Thanks to Talia Shaham for operating the behind the scenes controls. And thank you all for participating and for sticking it out right till the end. We hope you had as great a time as I did. Uh, Jake will follow up with you tomorrow with additional resources. And then when the video is up on CLES California's website, we will let you all know the, the link. And uh, you're welcome to watch it and share it. Uh, CLES California's Yiddish Culture Fund made six grants last fall, including to Jake in support of the next generation of Yiddish culture leaders, please consider making a gift of any amount to CLES California's Yiddish Culture Fund if you've already done that and some of you have. Thank you so much. The link is in chat. Please save chat. And we know you may have other things to do today, this evening. So we'll let you go now. And if you wanna stay on for a minute or two, 
to talk with Jake informally, you're welcome to. Thank you again for coming. It's Shane and Doc, Jake, and to everyone who participated. Thank you. Very nice. Nicely well, done, coming. sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll keep recording until we decide it's time to for me to press that button. Any final comments to Jake or questions or? That, that, that two week uh, rhythm actually like was solved a question in my head because I was thinking um, uh, at first of doing it on a monthly basis, but then I thought that would make people forget that there was something going on. Uh, so like this, the two weeks like happen over, you know, over time or was it does that just seem right? It was a relatively early, it wasn't my idea. Um, I think we had two monthly meetings and and then it was the second or third, I think it might, it might have been the second time that people said a month wasn't, wasn't often enough. Um, but to be honest, actually, a lot of months, we really have more than two things because, you know, some of us go to the land cries. I am not very good at going to the land cries, but like, I'm now becoming more active in the tribe tribe. So I'm seeing some of these people every week. Um, and then, you know, we have a visitor coming next week and it's in between our two week cycles. So I'm sure we're going to get together to hang out with that visitor and probably speak Yiddish. So it's it coming. really just depends on what's happening. What? <laughs> I'll ask you later. Um, you know who it is. <laughs> Who's the visitor? Who's coming? Um, no, I, I was just uh, I was I was curious to see a lot of parallels with uh, what we've been organizing on a Klezmer uh, sessions and Shell Berlin site, and I wonder how much of this organizing is um, really successful because of how easygoing Berlin is. Because certain things in Berlin are incredibly easygoing, so it kind of helps. Just a thought. Yeah, I think we're used to having these kinds of informal gatherings here. It's very um, DIY. You were you are very right to say that this is a very DIY place. You know, one thought I had about how to reach Yiddish speakers um, for Kles California. One of our one of the things people can say in there uh, when they sign up is whether they speak some or a lot of Yiddish. And so we can do mailings to 350 people who, you know, some in the Bay Area, some not, who say that they um, speak some Yiddish. It might be possible to ask uh, the Worker Circle or YIVO or the Yiddish Book Center if they have subscribers in your area. I mean, I don't know how responsive they would be to that. And certainly posting uh, on every shul in one's community and every other Jewish organization, I would think that would be the way to do it, you know, through synagogues, other Jewish institutions, and through national Yiddish-oriented organizations. And, I mean, also, I, I should add, um, if anybody is organizing something and wants to, like, have a, a call-out, I can I can insert a call-out into the Forverts' uh, weekly um, newsletter. It um, So, like, if, like, there's suddenly, suddenly is, like, a Washington group or, or whatever, or, or wherever in the world you are. And it's like, okay, like now's the time. Just like, just email me. I'll write my name and um, I'll, I'll just like have that be a blurb in the Forvert's uh, newsletter. Oh, hi, Zach. That's beautiful. Yeah. that's. <laughs> Other thoughts? Talia, Magali, Chavka, Myra, Mordcha. Francisca, Rina. Oh, Judy, I would like to ask you a question. Um, I'm interested in the, the Klesmer Schmooze groups. And what was that about being able to listen or? or? Well, the, the issue I raised was that Kles California has an online Fleecic Yiddish salon for fluent yeah. speakers, although yeah. mostly intermediate. And sometimes people want to know if they can participate. And that group has said no, that they don't want someone who's yeah. listening or lurking in a negative phrasing yeah. of it. They only want people who will speak because 
you know, if you're a kind of a shaky Yiddish speaker and you think there are people who are listening to you rather than participating, it can make you uncomfortable. Yeah. Other see, that we've discussed seem more open to having people come and listen. That's but, what I'd be interested in. Yeah. Um, there are several online Yiddish conversation groups that we have in our the resources section of our website that are in in different countries, in different communities. Um, I think Meryl uh, runs one of them, don't you, Meryl? You're muted if you want to answer. This one with Worker Circle that you operate, that you co-chair? That one, I'll, I'll answer for, for Meryl because maybe she's not listening right now. Um, but that went away because uh, the uh, app um, is no longer supported. But it was great for about a year right. and a half. Yeah. What's what's that? I'm blanking. Yeah, no, uh, it was called Wonder. Wonder. Yeah, the app went away and we didn't want to do it on Zoom because everybody else already has uh, conversation groups on Zoom. So, yeah, but we did it. Yeah, you're right. For about a year, it was very successful. So yeah, that, was, that was extraordinary in that there were these different groups that you could sort of navigate into online. So you could navigate into a group with beginners or a more advanced group, and you could hover and, and navigate from one group to the other during the one or one and a half hour period and speak with people pretty much about anything. And people would pop in and out, have a conversation, get to meet people um, and choose their level in real time in that conversation. So they could find like-minded folks on a political level or on a conversational capability level. Um, so uh, that that platform of wonder was was great in that regard. Is that the group that was through Worker Circle? Initially, it was initially it was just myself and um, Shmuel Label from uh, from the UK, and then we we had a, a friendly takeover by the Worker Circle. So, uh, but both of us and Baruch Bloom uh, usually attended every month to facilitate like, okay, you take beginners this month, I'll take intermediate and then, you know, sort of rotate it around and the events we figured they could take care of themselves. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I'll take it off our website then if it's not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was still there. <laughs> but it was a great, it was a, that was a great app in this regard because you could just basically walk into a room or walk out of another room, you know, no hard feelings. It was extraordinary <laughs> in that way. Okay. Other? I think, fine. I just, one comment myself. I think um, something that I should have said, I mean, it, it wasn't relevant in the moment to, uh, to our own group because we're still going, but, <laughs> but I think um, just because it, one of these groups it, it disbands, doesn't mean that all of the um, the benefits um, that happened during its existence go away. Like all these people spoke Yiddish during this period of time, met people, had interesting conversations, learned new words. Like mm -hmm. all of that was valuable, and the in, the you know people who are usually not being paid to organize these things, you know, it's it's not going to last forever potentially, but. Um, but I still think that it has so many benefits so that you you did that, that the two of you organized that and that that is a huge um, yeah. important accomplishment, whether or not you're organizing it now. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there were there was at least one person there from the Soviet Union. And this was uh, early on during the Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine. And he he was able to speak Yiddish with people and. And he he offered us a glimpse into what it was like for, it, it, admittedly, may not the possibly the most honest glimpse because he may have been concerned about what he said and who might be watching. But nonetheless, he was offered, able to speak from his heart about how he and his family were doing living in Moscow at this time when there was a rise in anti-Semitism. It was good to see that Yiddish left even then at the time. So you're absolutely right. And I'm sure we did the same for him in terms of giving him a little bit of a uh, a little bit of strength at that time, no doubt. Well, thank you for sharing that, Harvey. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was um, 
Yeah, and was it, and, and because it was very self moderated, there was a fellow from Jerusalem who would call in and ask him very pointed questions about, well, but isn't what Putin's doing? I mean, and 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 I would always try to sort of deflect those difficult questions because you never knew who was else was there who might be. I mean, God only knows what informants do and how all that world. And maybe I'm paranoid, but I think that there was a little bit of paranoia in the world. And so it's just good to see him and hear him and give him a chance to talk about the fact that he was surviving, he was managing. So, so th yeah, there are many different things going on in a group. I like it. just, just like, um, just like what you said. So, Jake, thank you for what you're doing and for, for making that comment about the fact that even in the transient period of time that these live things live, just like we all live, kind of sort of transiently, right? What we're doing is, is we're, we're, uh, to borrow a word from another religion, we're, we're resurrected. We're, we're Mechaya <laughs> Mason, but, but Yiddish is still alive. Well, Nish, you know, right? The end of the poem is Wer wird bleiben, Gott? Wer bleiben? bleiben is das nicht genug? <laughs> right. Well, um, yeah. And as long as we're here, we bleibt, right? Yeah. Well, so it has been a long time since we were here. Yeah, we have not yet gestorben. But... We're not, <laughs> we're not Mason yet, right? So, <laughs> so maybe it's more Mechaye Hakol, like the Reform folks say. Everything's alive, right? Maybe oh. that would be appropriate here. On um, yeah. note, <laughs> let's let's end on a positive note and <laughs> say once again thank you. thank you so much to Jake Schneider, and we look forward to. Many more good things from you and for every from everyone else who's here. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy, Bye. for programming this. Thank you, Jake.